content equals audience, audience equals engagement, engagement equals opportunities to monetize and make money. What is up, Merce Nation? Javier Mercedes here for yet again another Passion in Progress show, where content creators and entrepreneurs give practical advice to help you make a living out of your passion. On the 82nd episode of Passion in Progress, we're talking to the founder of Choir, spelled Q-U-I-R-E, and his name is Jason Anderson. As a firm, Choir helps media companies, particularly content-driven media companies, content producers, figure out new ways to grow and expand their businesses. Mm -hmm. And we do that by delivering first ideas, new ways to generate revenue, new forms of content, new businesses they could acquire, and then we deliver teams to help them execute those new strategies for themselves. In this episode, we talk about topics like how big media companies establish revenue streams and how those same concepts can translate over to individual content creators, especially when it comes to doing something unique. I think throughout this podcast episode, the theme here is to do something unique in order to be successful, or at least by doing something unique, you have a better path to success. And if you know where you want to go, then you'll avoid a lot of the terrible things that you see happen where you have someone who's achieved a certain amount of success and is trying to build to what's next and they're listening to everyone else tell them what they should be doing. Oh, you should do this kind of deal because a similar you know, YouTube person did that kind of deal or this mm -hmm. influencer did that kind of deal. That's terrible because <laughs> it's it may be short term money for you and it may make you feel kind of like, oh, I'm special too. But usually if you really want to do something exceptional, you're kind of bucking the trend a little bit and you're doing something a little bit different and unique or else ultimately you're going to just look like everybody else. Jason is one of those guys where I loved sitting in the room and hearing his thoughts on media. He definitely has a unique perspective on where content creation is going. We get into the future of podcasting. We also talk about how Netflix won in the battle between Netflix and Blockbuster and a whole other spectrum of topics that I know you're going to have interest in, like Martha Stewart. And as always, if you're getting value out of this show and you want to share it with a friend, I would not stop you in any way, shape or form. You could post it on Instagram, Twitter. You could share it via a actual message by writing it down on a piece of parcel and sending it to your grandmother through the mail. You could do that for me and this podcast, The Passion and Progress Show. <laughs> With all that business stuff out of the way, let's get into the 82nd episode of Passion and Progress with the founder of Choir, Jason Anderson. What a lot of people that follow this show could get from this is when I think of monetization, I think of like YouTube ads, like Patreon and um, like sure. affiliate links and other things like that. But what are some other things that people could look towards when you're for the clients that you work with? Because it's these are whole teams of people. Like, how do you sustain a business around content creation for like huge, sure. massive teams? Yeah, it's it's really, really interesting when you think about who we tend to work with, which are corporations, right? Yeah. Large publishers, let's say a, a Vice, a Refinery29, a yeah. Fandom. Much bigger than a single YouTuber. <laughs> Correct. But when you distill down what they're doing, it's the same intention no matter what. You're trying to deliver a piece of really well-developed and thoughtful content to an audience that's going to be excited about engaging around it. Mm -hmm. It's always the same intention. And it's it could be about a piece about fashion. It could be about politics. It could be about really anything in the world, but those are always the same intentions. Our clients just happen to be in 20 different business lines. They're making anything from short form video for social, it could be YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera, to long form video for a TV show to go on HBO or to go on a cable network, to products and services. Now a lot of the clients that are in digital before thought about themselves as video producers or editorial producers writing news articles. Now they want to be direct to consumer companies where they're taking, it could be a really strong YouTube channel where someone's consuming information around fashion and lifestyle. And now they want to create retail experiences where they're delivering direct to consumer athletic wear or makeup experiences. If you think about um, who, what, where that business, where they went from being just a beautiful blog to being a digital publisher to now delivering product into Target in the form of athletic wear. So all of our clients focus on those pieces across the puzzle, but it all goes back to 
content equals audience, audience equals engagement, engagement equals opportunities to monetize and make money. So it's very, very similar. Let me ask, how important is it, the quality of the product in the beginning? It really honestly depends. If you're, if you're playing the game at the very top end, if you're a large publisher, yeah. one of those types of companies, it's very important to have strong editorial, a bustle, a refinery, a fandom. They have to be able to engage audiences consistently, mm -hmm. and they're building brands, and this is, goes for a YouTuber as well, they're bidding, building brands so that in a sea of alternate options every morning when you wake it's up of things. It's getting ever so bigger. <laughs> exactly. You need to, if you're leaning towards quality and that's your goal as a, as a company or as an individual producer, you have to be consistent. You have to be on brand and your audience has to understand what they're going to experience because that's why they're coming to you and that's why they initially became engaged and excited about you. So our clients spend an inordinate amount of time concerned about that every day. How do we go from always being perceived historically as premium to staying in that spot as being premium? And there's an inherent fall off that you sometimes see over time where it's when you're starting and you're small and you're just doing a handful of videos a day, it's really easy to be extremely creative, particularly when you have an inventory of ideas that have been waiting to be produced. Yeah. When you're large, it's like being a record label, right? Like a big music producer. You need to go in every morning and have 20 new ideas, and that's extremely hard. So our clients tend to have, I'm sure younger producers do as well, but a ton of anxiety around staying relevant. Mm -hmm. is remaining extremely engaged and then making sure that their brand is one that when audiences think about if it be going to their iPad in the morning or if it just be their, their normal social feed that they'll stop for a moment, actually dwell on that content while they're streaming past a thousand other different you know posts that they're seeing every day. So it's, it's a really, really tough challenge, mm -hmm. extremely hard. What has worked in the past for what you've been doing for these larger corporations in terms of monetization? Yeah, so a lot of the transition that you've been seeing is you went from big publishers, video publishers or editorial publishers, owned and operated websites, and then the side social channels that existed. It was first, we're a big publisher, we have this dot com and we're doing that. Even in the most current generation, and then social over the last five years became extremely important as a marketing channel, a promotions channel. And then there was the, a huge amount of, of hope and anticipation that it would become a really powerful monetization channel. And you, you saw our clients leaning deeply into social and even be building social groups within their companies to build specific kinds of content and editorial. So in terms of monetizing, you obviously have the core, which is if you own a blog or you own a website, you monetize there through run a site traffic that comes through and the ad tech you've built or selling deals directly to brands or different sponsors for your website. And then in, into social, we saw them bridge out and use their social for bigger campaigns that they were running, running video inventory against social, and then obviously doing sponsorships against social. So they were able to take that similar audience that might be consuming on social when they're you know, en route somewhere versus sitting on the actual website when they're more leaned back and consuming more content. They were able to expand into that as monetization and then you saw events start to pop up like with Refineries 29 Rooms. People were trying to figure out or Fatherly, they did an amazing activation recently with Gillette where they said, okay, we have a core audience, they consume our content every day on social, on our websites, can we bring them into a single location? And anyone can kind of figure out how to do this if you have a brand sponsor. And they rented out a location and they made it more feel like an art exhibit, and like deeply engaging content about what does it mean to be a father? How do you think about that experience? Which is the same intention that everyone who goes to their social and goes to their website is there looking for, but they were able to be, bring in a, a large brand in Gillette and get a ton of, of economic value out of it and the brand got a ton of value out of it by connecting engaged audiences focus on fatherhood and what it means to be a father and then building a new monetization through a place or experience and then the last piece is merchandise and different experiences on that front everyone is trying to figure out are there ways of understanding the data related to our audiences and it could be a, a small youtube channel or it could be a massive 150 million monthly unique big website you're asking the fundamental question that Jeff Bezos asked when he created Amazon, which was, what does the customer want? What are they, <laughs> what are they trying to consume? You make it sound so simple. Yeah, well, it is, it is a really simple question, right? Yeah. It's, 
if you could build something and you understood what they wanted, you have a better chance of being successful, right? Because you understand demand. Yeah. And in, in the instance of some of the digital publishers now and the digital, uh, the digital brands, and it could be a, a consumer brand as well, they're asking, okay, since we understand the data around how people are consuming, what articles they like, what kinds of similar products they're clicking on and looking at, you can extract that data and understand it in the context of your audience and say, if we were ideating a new product, maybe it's a collaboration with a sneaker brand, with our brand. Maybe it's a, a brand new, you know, reimagining like Glossier did, you know, makeup and eyeliner, but for their audience on a more narrow basis. A lot of that merchandise and direct to consumers top of mind for everyone because now you don't have to be a multi-million dollar or billion dollar company to have a product and sell it directly to your consumers. And that's a massive change. And so everyone, and this is what really led to a huge change in our attitude is we really look now at media, and it doesn't matter if it's a YouTube channel, a massive website, a TV show, a movie, a documentary. Those are really just strong, deep engaged forms of marketing and engagement. Where you take that engagement is about your understanding of your audience and what they're interested in, in consuming. If it be more content, if it be experiences out in the world like events, or if it be merchandise that's connected to their admiration and appreciation of you. And that's the simplest way to kind of think about it. And it, honestly, if you wanted to like, this is how your grandmother would understand it. Mm -hmm. it, it. Everything that's new is really old. As you grow older and start looking at the world in new ways, these are the same models that we had in like the 1950s where you had like, or even in the 90s with Martha Stewart. Her job was to be a media icon so she could sell you housewares. <laughs> There's no difference between that and the amazing people who have YouTube channels where they have, they do recipes so that they can get a sponsorship from um, um, a housewares company yeah. or they can do a Mayfair TV commercial. It's the same motivations at the end of the day. And human beings, we ha we've changed young and old in that we're more connected and we're more open to these engagement points, but we're still looking to love brands. Like you love certain brands. I love Apple and I'll buy whatever they tell me to buy. <laughs> it's so I, true. Yeah, you know what Brainwashed I mean? Brainwashed by Apple, yeah. Yeah, but that's the holy grail. And as a young, as a young person or as an older digital website, that's, it's the same desire. Be close and connected to your audience. Have them fall in love with you and then figure out how to have a, a beautiful relationship with them where... In the morning, they're consuming content. In the afternoon, they're using a product of yours. And then in the evening, they're using you to, to navigate what next experience they want to have in the, you know, out with their friends. Like it's those are the types of relationships that they're trying to build now rather than just be a website or yeah. a social channel. Mm -hmm. They want to be part of your lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. The I would liken it to music and you listen to your favorite artists, but then you go see them live. And totally. And that I think a perfect example of this is in a, a culmination of so many different kinds of brands is South by Southwest. During South by Southwest, you go, and even Vice is there. Uh, they have their, their pop-up their pop tents. But because of that, you have a actual tie, a physical experience with whatever that brand is. And whenever something pops up, um, whether I'm flipping through or I see Vice, now I have this inherent um, uh, memory of like, oh yeah, I remember when I was at the petted goats at the Vice pop-up at South by Southwest, exactly. which is like, does that have anything to do with them? Only that I had that experience at that place, exactly. but it's like, that's how it ties in. So I think personally, in today's day and age of so much digital, if you can have something that's offline and where, like you said, other people kind of uh, gather at the same place, then you have the like-minded individuals, then it kind of perpetuates itself in the fact that if you're, le if you're meeting those like-minded individuals, then you start building a community in and of itself it, because you had that one brand tie, which is like, keeps yeah. going further and further and further down the like- It does. The, the thing. If somebody's starting out and let's say they do have the quality product, um, and just for the sake of this podcast, it's like it's a creator or something like that. They're, sure. they're, they're making um, videos and they might start getting a following of some sort, whether it be like what we were talking about, cookware, sneakers, whatever it may be. Yeah. How do they approach building that team or finding those other revenue streams or whatever that may be? Yeah. 
Well, the first step in all of those pieces is that the individual who sits at the center asking themselves, like, what is my boldest aspiration? Where, where are they trying to I go? I love that. You, you reverse engineer it. You have to. <laughs> you have to because this is the reality. There's, there's too many, and this isn't getting sidetracked from your main question. This is just setting up mentally how to think about it first because it's, it's fine to be desirous of capital or growth or notoriety or fame or whatever it might be. Those things are all fine. But when you take in capital and you write a business plan, it's like putting concrete around your feet. You have to really be ready for that because it will hold you in place and force you to, to take certain movements because you now have committed yourself to someone through a contractual relationship with them. So in order to feel comfortable with that, the idea of the difference between swimming and sinking is you have to feel like those weights around your ankles aren't weights at all, but they're like actually lifting you up. So the way that you do that mentally is first is whoever that entrepreneur is, they have to tell the world what it is they want to build because capital will force you to try to build something because capital is very right now, particularly it's it's there's a ton of it out there there's a lot of people looking to get behind new concepts and there's with the right business plan and with the right amount of like you know self-starting activity you'll be able to raise capital the question is have you just put yourself into a prison so the first place is you step back and you say all right Today I'm doing X, whatever it might be. I have you know X number of channels, I'm doing X number of views, I'm making X number of money. This is what I imagine my strategy wants to look like. I want to own, you know, I want to have X increases in audience. I want to have three incremental brand partnerships. I want to be doing something. I'm just making this up. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I just I want to be uh, a host of a, a linear TV show within the next six months. Like you need to define for the world what you want to achieve and what your goals are like the next year the next three years and really the next five years and you need to make them something that you know will get you up every morning and want to like run through walls and then you step back and then you start to slowly backwards engineer into what are the pathways to get there and what are the components of that business strategy because oftentimes if you haven't built businesses before or spent your career building businesses it's almost like someone who says, I want to be a professional athlete. It's just super generic. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, there's a hundred different ways to get there to be a professional athlete. And then if, instead, if you say, well, why do you want to be a professional athlete? What is it about it that you know is important to you? Is it fame? Is it wealth? Is it just having that role and, and experiencing what it means to play in front of bright lights and huge stadiums? What are you trying to achieve? And then you sit back and start building the components of the business model. And when people talk about business models, we like to like say that word and everyone's like, oh, business model, business model. Business model is kind of like if you were building a house, the little pieces that sit inside of a business model are like the pieces to a house, right? The cabinetry and the kitchen, the sink and the bathroom. You'll then start mapping, this is my vision of what I wanna be. I wanna have this kind of business. I wanna be doing this kind of content. I wanna be making this kind of money. And then you back into, all right, what business model would support that? And then more importantly, once you figure out the basic raw materials of your business, just like building a house, what is the foundation going to look like? What are the dimensions? You then sit with smart business people and go and financing people and go, this is what I want. How do we do this exceptionally in creative ways mm -hmm. um, and be different? And to your point about brand, not look like everyone else, even though you're extracting some of the similar business model components you want to be making content. You don't want to be making like marshmallows because you're a content <laughs> producer. Yeah. You want to be able to distribute it widely over distribution platforms where you know there's going to be audience rather than building your own brand new platform from scratch unless that's your vision. And so all those pieces, business people can help you sort out. And then essentially what you do is you'll be have this architected strategy and then a financial person who's the least important person of all of this, frankly, no offense to all the people I worked with for years is they'll sit down and quantify what it costs you, what the timelines, you know, headcount cost or investment cost for technology and content, legal, all the stuff to build your organization and, and cost it out. And then you'll circle amount of money. That's the best way to do it. Start with your vision, figure out a unique business model, and then figure out what that costs. 
just like building a house, same idea. What do we want? What is our vision? Who do we get to help us, in, you know, like architect, the general contractor, mm -hmm. the carpenter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then once everyone sits down and you have a beautiful plan and you can see it in real, real life, the finance people come in and tell you what it costs because yeah. people cost are people cost. A, a CTO is X amount of dollars. A marketing person is X amount of dollars. Um, buying software, technology is X amount. Of, these are all known quantifiable things. The unknown and what makes businesses exceptional and powerful are the, actually the things you start with, the vision, mm -hmm. the passion, to your point, passion mm -hmm. and progress. Yeah. And how, what is it that makes one person set up for success versus someone else? It, sometimes it's the business people underlying them, but it's pretty rare. It's usually the attitude and idea where that really gets things started and, and rolling. Or if you're off pace, like if you're a broken company, usually what restarts and reinvigorates companies strangely, as crazy as you think it isn't money or a bunch of suits going in and like going, oh, this company's broken, let's fix it. It's actually changing the narrative that everyone is focused on with that company and reestablishing a vision and a purpose for it and a yeah. culture. And then you'll start seeing it change. No amount of money will make unhappy people happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? I feel like that could just be taken for anything in life. It's totally true. <laughs> it's totally true. And so that's the way, if you think about funding, that's the way I would start if I was someone who was seeing growth in my channels and seeing progress and saying, hey, I want to be much, much bigger than where I am today but I don't know how to get there. And if you know where you want to go, then you'll avoid a lot of the terrible things that you happen, that you see happen where you have someone who's achieved a certain amount of success and is trying to build to what's next and they're listening to everyone else tell them what they should be doing. Oh, you should do this kind of deal because a similar you know, YouTube person did that kind of deal or this mm -hmm. influencer did that kind of deal. That's terrible. Because <laughs> it's it may be short term money for you, and it may make you feel kind of like, oh, I'm special too. But usually, if you really want to do something exceptional, you're kind of bucking the trend a little bit, and you're doing something a little bit different and unique, or else ultimately you're going to just look like everybody else in time. And you see this particularly in social. You see this rapid replication. Someone does something kind of cool, and then 50 people are replicating it within a week. You avoid that if in the beginning when you're starting to envision what your next steps are, if you're always just like, I love the idea of music. It's just like if you're a music artist, you don't want to look like every and sound like everyone else when you first come out, because then they'll just say, oh, this is just a Cardi B like wannabe. Yeah. This is just this guy is trying to be like this guy. Um, and that's why I always say it's what what's most attractive to capital strangely isn't what they've already seen. It's what they want to see. And usually entrepreneurs and people that are building their own visions for their organizations are always thinking about what's coming next. What's across the horizon? What do I want to become? What's the future? And so when you start mapping those two pieces together, it's a much more powerful combination in terms of pure vision, entrepreneurial spirit and passion with pools of capital looking to support and fund those new initiatives. Um, with, that yeah. being, with, with that being said, uh, I know you worked for media buying or something like that within Wall Street. Do you want to talk about what, what that does and, and how that correlates to what you were just talking about? Yeah, in terms of what I did on Wall Street, like yeah, my yeah, job. Yeah, yeah so my, my job, if you were to think about today when we, we read these articles about WeWork pulling its IPO or we hear about um, companies that are raising huge amounts of money to fund their businesses, billions of dollars. My job was to sit with media companies, film, TV, cable networks, large cap media companies like Disney, Time Warner, Verizon, those kinds of companies, and help them acquire businesses that could help grow their business like through M&A, mergers and acquisitions, mm -hmm or help them raise capital through bond deals or equity deals so that they could fund in new divisions for their businesses. And then I also worked with smaller companies that were going through the process of hyper growth and needed to raise really substantial amounts of money from individual investors, private equity groups, family offices, and then institutions like venture capital groups. So my whole career was that that process of raising capital and helping helping these clients access money. And that's what's given me my outsider sort of perspective inward, where you're 
you're seeing entrepreneurs come through the banking system going, oh God, I, I, you know, I've done something amazing. I want to raise money. I want to drive my business. I want to continue to grow. And I would, I would basically help them connect to these capital sources. So just like strangely like a talent agent like fewer you know popular influencer mm -hmm. endeavor or ca may approach you to be part of their influencer group we were kind of on the other side for corporates we'd be peering down and watching these companies grow and evolve and going oh these guys have gotten big enough now let's go and pitch them and say hey you've already raised 20 million dollars what do you think about raising 100 million dollars <laughs> you know you've already raised 100 what do you think about half a billion or you've already gotten to a certain size what do you think about selling now and so all the founders can be billionaires that's what my job was is and no wall street investment maker likes to admit it but in the end you're the same as like a real estate broker you're just sitting in between huge amount of some money on one side, which is effectively the buyers, and then the sellers, which are individuals or corporations that are selling stock or debt to these other individuals. And you're just clearing a market, which is just Wall Street language for saying, you're just brokering a sale. Yeah. But what it teaches you, which is the most important thing, which is learning that oftentimes the biggest drivers of success is you're thinking about funding and you're thinking about growing your business are really who you partner with and where you take that capital from. And if you're a small a small channel or in, in building an audience and kind of thinking, I wish I could get bigger faster, the worst thing you could do is all of a sudden go and raise three million bucks based on some you know crazy idea that is gonna distract the hell out of you and not really be what you want to do versus maybe defining exactly what you wanna do in stages raising a smaller amount of capital and saying, hey, I raised half a million, I'm gonna put it towards this. And I think these get me to these next pieces and these next steps in my business. And then from there, you start thinking about capital is exactly something that's fungible, which is the right, using a big word for saying that if you're doing something great, if you're building a real business and if you're showing progress, capital will be there. Absent a massive recession where like it's a zombie state and we're all walking around and worried that we're gonna be homeless, uh, capital is always looking for great ideas and that's why we always first and foremost focus on what is your idea? What are you trying to achieve? Not in a negative way, but in a, a very like, have you thought through this? Um, both from a, aspirational standpoint because if someone comes in with a 50 page business plan and they're like bouncing off the walls you know that they are going to work like they're just <laughs> yeah. gonna go crazy where you know where if it doesn't feel that way you kind of have to step back and go all right what are the motivations here and sometimes the motivations can just be i want to get rich or i want to be famous or has that ever worked out um you're like, I actually haven't invested in those. <laughs> no, actually, they're, this is the thing, and um, I'll, I'll say it very, very nicely, is that there are lots of examples where that happens. And the reason why is it's like timing. Like if um, there's a, that Malcolm Gladwell book, Outliers, I don't know if you ever read that. It talks mm -hmm. about how... Love Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, yeah. It talks about how timing... And just circumstance can play a, have a big role and a big impact on, you know, your success or failure way mm -hmm. outside of your hands. I've definitely seen in cycles where someone or, or some company has figured out that something is popular and kind of get in front of it and aren't doing it for the right reasons. They're just doing it to make money or they saw a business that's similar and they want to get rich. You know, I just graduated from Stanford and I got to have a tech startup. So they yeah. basically mimic somebody else's startup and in the right cycle when there's a lot of buyers or investors yeah i've seen it work out for sure <laughs> it doesn't ever work out over the long term usually those deals turn out to be terrible deals the companies end up imploding over time but if you catch it just right you know what i mean yeah. just right in the cycle you can see that happen and honestly if you this is nothing against the press and even my own clients frankly um we spend so much time talking about those random successes in our world versus focused on the fact that it's so hard to build a business. It's just to even get something started, it is brutally difficult. Mm -hmm. We tend to focus on those things. So people actually think that success is easier than it really, really is. It's very hard, even for great, huge corporations that have, you know, 
boundless resources, boundless people. Google fails like on things. Apple fails on products. Like everybody fails. That's that's the normal thing. But yeah, the reality is sometimes sh- shit is, I like to say, shitty products and services succeed for a period. And then, <laughs> I like how you're being real about it. Though. Yeah, exactly. And, and then in time, the customer figures it out. Yeah. You know, and then we all go, you know. For those done. that are just listening, he did the little, like the cut it off. Yeah, exactly. We're done with this one now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. It sounds like your expertise comes in with you have an overall view of whatever a company or person is trying to accomplish. And then you can come in and just come with a completely different mindset totally. of how to approach a success in that business. How does it look like uh, when it when you are thinking about money transactions? Because yeah. what I th- what I'm hearing is that you may approach a client or a prospective client and say, I, you, it sounds like you might have the idea to say, like, I don't know if you actually need to be looking for capital right now. How do how does how do those conversations kind of look? If the conversation even starts um, and begins to percolate within a company, it's one of two things. Either one, they're growing really fast, right, and they're like, uh oh, we need money because if we don't have money, we're not going to be able to achieve our goals. So yeah. that one's a positive one. That one's usually much more, I just call it like tactical. Okay, how much do we need? Like what's the amount and who are the right sources for it? And we'll carve up the world of private equity, venture capital, strategic investors like big corporations that mm-hmm. invest in things and say, where should we get it? That's the positive one. There's a lot of pressure, obviously, because they can't slow down. It's like a rocket ship. Like, yeah. You can't take the thrust off. You have to keep pushing. So there's timing pressures there. That one's a little bit easier because you can kind of figure out and map. The story is going to be amazing. There's lots of growth, lots of excitement around the business. They've achieved their goals so far. And now we're coming and saying, look, you can join this, you know, join up with us when everything's amazing. It's beautiful. Um, the other side of it is the darker side, which is where things are tough, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone, and this is a great topic right now because there's so many articles, if you look in the press around digital publishers, from Vice Refinery merging to Group 9, their recent transaction. And and so Bustle, the, the deals that they've done with Rachel Zoe, with Mike, those are transactions where it's the, the inverse, where these are companies that are struggling and trying to figure out how do we come together and support ourselves. There it's a lot harder. There's way more sensitivity because when you think about the progression, and this is why getting your partners right in the beginning is so critically important. When you've taken in other rounds of capital, they had expectations. It's like... You know, it's like a partner in a relationship. You have got into a relationship and established a certain set of of needs and their expectations were usually capital related, meaning you need to be increasing the value of my investment. And these companies find themselves where they're not increasing the value, they're decreasing the value of that investment. So those prior investors have a voice into where are you getting the capital from? What does the valuation look like? And are we gonna take a hit, meaning, as you do those rounds of financing, you're hoping that you're increasing each time and your company isn't theoretically worth more. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden you're facing a situation where it's gonna be worth way less. So those other older investors are saying, wow, I'm gonna to have to go back to my investors where they got their capital from and explain to them that this one is a die, it's dying. <laughs> You know, so, so many tears of money flow right now. Exactly. <laughs> it is. It's it's a very sad thing for them, but it's not. It's it's in the end, it's it, they made an economic decision. It didn't work out well. And now you're having to have all these conversations. And that's if you look across digital media, particularly the publishers that were super hot five years ago. They're all dealing with this right now of how do we bring in more money? Because we got to keep growing. But no one believes our valuations anymore. Um, So that's usually the core dynamic. If it's growing really well, you have no shortage of opportunity. You're like, you pick your future. You pick who you want to work with. If you're on the other side, you pray to God that someone is going to be excited about you and that you can get the capital you need to keep on going. Because where we are in the the cycle in digital in, in many areas is, We've gone through the, the the hype side where everyone thought, oh, you're you know a YouTube creator, you're valuable, or you're mm-hmm. an influencer, you're valuable, or you're a digital publisher, you're valuable. You're all going to be the future. 
and where we were talking about billion dollar valuations for some of these companies, now everyone's looking at it and going, uh, uh-uh, we don't believe that anymore. We think that your guys are worth way less. And so that shrinks the pool of capital because people coming into that dynamic are like, ooh, this sounds way more risky than when, when everyone was celebrating every week, you know, some yeah. new success. So those are the two sides of, of, of learning about the, the dynamic and the potential relationship with capital. But in the end, it, it, it really is driven by where the company is, how it's doing, and then ultimately what history it's already built behind it in the past. And those are the tensions. What would you say, going back to, I think, um, one of your first answers, owned and operated versus social space versus whatever the else it's going to be in the future. Yeah. It seems like when I think of going on the internet now, I don't even think about uh, going up to the top browser and clicking. And even if I did put something in there, it's going to be a Google search. Yeah, for uh, sure. Uh, yeah. Which I think is crazy in today's day and age of like something so simple as like TikTok now and, and those that it's an app. But I think of the internet as a culmination of social media apps as opposed to here is a owned and operated dot com org and all that kind of Completely. stuff. Completely. Um, where <laughs> I just want to know your opinion on what, yeah. what what that is right now. And for everybody that's building things, it just seems I think the advice that most people get is you have to build your own and operated space because you don't know what's going to happen with an algorithm change right. on anything. But where the eyeballs are, in my mind, are in all of these social spaces, and each one kind of plays its different role in order to yeah. click through to your owned and operated. But at the same time, I feel like the the disparity there in where people are going is like, it's just so much more convenient to be browsing on a social media app to get your content than to go specifically to a source. Completely. What, what is your opinion on it? So this is this is the... This is actually a very philosophical question, <laughs> yeah. right? When you think about it, I'll, I'll frame it a little bit different because this is, this is the way I believe people should be thinking about this question. The way you frame the question is one that assumes that progression represents something good that has happened. And I'll say this, it sounds really esoteric, but it's more simple this way is we went from having websites where one person like Yahoo controlled it in the middle and we mm-hmm. would click on blue links and get to stuff to everybody having their own website and then this population you think about it like real estate everyone yeah. had their own you know front office space didn't matter who you were everyone you know everyone had a dot com or buying a URL and that still goes on today then we moved into a place with social and blogs both in terms of editorial content text yeah. as well as video my my view is this like if you were to ask the question of where we're going i'd ask it much more fundamentally is why have we followed this progression that's a technological progression and to your point about your main point in that is that the behavior of the user or the consumer doesn't care about technological progression mm-hmm. my b- belief is this is that what we've just seen is as human beings we've been taken through this process of experiencing these technologies because that's what we've developed we yeah. you know youtube came later so we saw social video later what if youtube would have come first would we be even ask even talk why would you even talk about owned and operated websites it's just a, it's a histological history you know sort of historical kind of fact that we're talking this way but i would say this is that where I think the everything is moving is towards a central focus on audience. First and foremost, people are saying, this is what I'm delivering to the world. If it be video content, editorial content, auditory content, merchandise or whatever, they're just saying, who is my audience? What experiences do I want to deliver? And how do I want to figure out how to monetize? And then you step back and you say, what channels are most ideal for me? And how should I think about that? Because then you may actually decide, and this sounds insane, that a, 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 a thick 200 page printed magazine that comes every three months to someone is the right product for you to sell. You could yeah. actually come to that <laughs> because your long-term strategy could be one where, and there's a company doing this, this is why I brought it up because it's a brilliant idea, they believe that there's been such a negative reaction towards reading physical things that they're creating a $30 every three month big magazine that essentially is 
a way of, of creating lead gen for all kinds of other experiences for their audiences from travel to products to all of that. And they just want to like focus on a really high end audience, almost kind of like how Goop really focused on, are you, can you spend a thousand dollars on a knickknack kind of audience? Mm -hmm. And so for them, they realize that to really be transmedia, which is like leaping over where technology and content is today into the future, they're saying, well, actually the human behavior, humans still love to read. If you go to the subway in New York City, you see people, young people all the time with physical books in their hands. It's almost nostalgic. It's like cool in a way. Yep. So they're like, let's draft on that cool and do super high end lifestyle based fashion editorial, make it expensive so it feels exclusive and scarce and then figure out who our core client is, who our core audience is that we know is gonna tune in every three months and be open to these marketing messages to your point of how do you make money and monetize? Mm -hmm. You see where I'm going, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Then all of a sudden you have a million people subscribing and paying you money. You're making money on a magazine. They're then looking at advertisements to travel, to buy jewelry, to buy clothing. And then you're making money off of those ads as well. And you're building, to your point, a community that you now can partner with American Express and do travel experiences for a week and a half in Italy together with your audience. Like These are the things that start creating that engagement. And then when you have a million people doing that and you started expanding outward, you've already started with a beautiful core demographic, wealthy, educated, worldly, um, politically conscious, impact oriented. All of a sudden that's your audience you can do whatever you want with them. You can build a website and direct them there. You can build a social channel and direct them there. You can build a, a long form documentary with Netflix and some huge brand trying to change the world and direct them there as well and own that documentary. You could have a, you know, a video series on um, like fashion designers and own that. It's like once you understand who your audience is and what they'll consume or what excites them, you can figure out how to monetize them those ways. That's that's the way I'd be asking the question. Not I don't care about platforms. It doesn't matter. Understand the utility of each and the limitations of each. Because we've seen in the past where people have made major mistakes where they asked about platform first and said, okay, everyone's on social now. I need to move my content on a social. That's destroying a lot of, or it has destroyed a lot of the smaller publishers. You brought up the algo algorithm changes which was really just about, we put a bunch of content on social hoping it was gonna drive either direct engagement and monetization there, which everyone struggled to do, or people are gonna consume for free, because I'm helping YouTube, my content to come back to my website, because there I can serve them some ads, or a, a lead gen, a referral, or something else to make money off of it. And the dynamic never really worked. And to your point now, with digital publishers, anybody who has an amazing brand, if you think about the amount of content you consume every day, just Apple Reader, right? We'll just focus on that experience. How many brands do you actually pick up on when you're reading through Apple Reader? Two, maybe. And they're probably the same ones you cared about before anyway, because you took notice of them, right? So you're, the Apple Reader isn't helping you aggregate audience. It isn't helping you hold audience. It's just delivering, if you've already paid for a subscription through that app to them, or they're just giving you a long stream of essentially free content, hoping you're going to do Apple, you know, Apple Reader Plus and become a, their subscriber. So it's it doesn't really work for core brands. It doesn't really work as a way of holding audience. And that's been the major issue. So we just look at it differently. And we just say, if you understand what your bold vision and mission is, you understand who your audience is you're trying to get to, figure out how you want to ultimately engage them, excite them and monetize them, and then pick your channels because the most brilliant companies never and you can look at any stupid business book from you know start with why not stupid these are great business books <laughs> you know peter anything peter Thiel writes and the surest way to die quickly is to replicate your competition so if you're just thinking platform you're going to be replicating your competition's distribution strategy day one and that's 100 percent of your audience and they're all coming there and they can just literally watch you all day long and figure out what you're doing to mimic you and that someone else is sitting there watching you too it's hard to be competitively aggressive that way unless you get really lucky in the beginning and do something just it has a huge splash most people on YouTube scale, you know, fail to really, really scale their audience. And the reason is simple. It's just there's so many people, so much churn, and it's a snackable behavioral moment. Um, whereas if you want to own and control an audience, 
not control, but if you want to own an audience and continually, you know, make them excited, you really have to understand them much more deeply and get to them. Like while they're thinking of you, while they're going there versus the opposite, going there and just happening to see you and going, oh, you're there again. All right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, hey. Hey, what's up? <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and that's interesting. You talked about, um, like earlier, I know you did stuff with the chive. They were one of the ones that early on they, they looked at their brand and how they were engaging, which was extremely snackable and it did map to social and worked really well for them. And they could use social for lead, you know, for referral back to their website, which worked for a period of time and then stopped working as well. And, and that was very indicative of how most people experienced it, where they would put stuff on social, get a little bit of traffic back or be able to use some of that social inventory to do uh, video executions. But then there, you look at fandom, they didn't do any social for forever. They focused just on SEO. And if you were to look at the two companies side by side now, and this is, I'm using this example because it's counterintuitive. They shunned completely social and they're in a much better place just through their SEO because they built deeply engaged fans who spend a lot of time on site. Every Google search you do because they have community, 415,000 communities because they focused there and made them flourish and figured out how to give people editorial tools. I would say that fandom's in a much better place because every time you're at fandom for most audience, you know, for most of their audience, um, they've gotten there either because they've searched for something that's specifically relevant to things they're interested in, or they've come there directly for that, that website itself. And that's a powerful driver of success and, and value in the future. And there's no confusing why you're there or as social, it's, it's harder because we would look at their, so we would look everyone, we would look honestly at everyone's social traffic and try to understand why it didn't have the same level of engagement and, and what was going on. And the answer is that you're just behaving so differently in the different environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love the podcast business wars and I just got done listening to the Netflix versus Blockbuster. Okay. And, and uh, in there, and I'm just bringing it up as a reference yeah. to Netflix saw the whole, in the very beginning, saw the whole like DVD to consumer thing. So they, they mapped that thing and then they built the infrastructure so they could get it there even faster. Then Blockbuster was like, well, let me let us copy this model. And they were sending people to like go take quote unquote selfies at the Netflix distribution centers just to like see what was going on. Fast forward, Netflix had to get in front of everybody else because they knew once other people got privy to the fact that, oh, if you have the content online and you can stream it in quality, everybody else is just going to, it's like such a simpler business model and you can make so much more margins and everything. So they're like, how do we get there fastest to do the things? And yeah. they started out with like the not so good B type movies and everything, but yeah. people were watching it. And I think it was because of the convenience and it was cheaper. And then all of a sudden they started doing their own thing. And then they came out with house of cards and it was like, Oh, now we have our own owned, um, uh, real estate of a show. People can right. have to come here, but then things like HBO were coming along and they're like, well, we have game of Thrones. They're like Netflix wanted to be like the HBO of the online space. And then, then like switching it around HBO wanted to be like the Netflix in like, and the now we're in this place. Space. Yeah. And now, yeah. now we're in this place where everybody has their own original shows and like Disney just started Disney plus and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. I think it's crazy be getting to the, um, thinking about the audience perspective. Uh, there it's like, there's so many places you can go now for the snackable content. It's like completely diffused the cable concept. And now it's like, where do you want to go a la carte for your content? That's right. Um, I, I, when you were talking, that's what I, it reminded me of in yeah. just the terms of these people started at first. And by these people, I mean Netflix. And then everybody else was kind of copying that model. But now it's kind of the norm of if you make your original content, you can go watch it in that certain space. Well, if you think about that's like a really brilliant analysis. I oftentimes when I think about, I know the banker that actually worked with Blockbuster when they were going down, <laughs> Alan. Um, but that's beside the point. It wasn't his fault, obviously. Um, but from what I heard, it was it was yeah. they had to reach a certain. Um, they had to reach a certain uh, money mark and then they actually would have been profitable. But the way that they saw the losses, it was just like 
management or whoever it was didn't want to keep continuing on their their online content model and yeah. if they just would have kept going towards a certain way they could have gotten over the hump but i don't think yeah. they did well it's it's the easiest way to think about it and it goes back to your question earlier around how do you think about platforms blockbuster was always no joke distribution they were never a creative organization, not meaning that they weren't creative in terms of business model, but they're sort of like the movie theater business. As much as the movie theater business wants to convince you that they're creative people, they're just distribution. They, they build seats, they have concessions, you go in and watch a movie. They sit in between the creatives, the studio, and the customer. Netflix said this, they saw that in the end that Blockbuster was not only fighting the realities that they were sitting in the middle and just being a distributor and not adding any value to the experience of the consumer. When you would go to Blockbuster and rent a videotape, what were they adding? Nothing other than me physically being able to touch the tape and take it with me, right? Or the yeah. DVD, nothing of value. Netflix looked at it differently, which was if we could understand the consumer and what they're consuming and why they're <laughs> viewing it, yeah. then we can build an extremely bold strategy that says, we don't want to be Blockbuster. We want to be Disney. That's a very different mindset. Do you think Blockbuster ever sat around going, we want to be Disney? Like in those crazy khaki pants and, you know, polos? No way. They might have pushed around the concept of doing things in that area. But what really, in the end of the day, Netflix did, if you think about them as a, an intellectual transition, is that they did a lot of things that everyone everyone laughed at, particularly those big licensing deals of the big catalogs, to learn and understand what the consumer wanted so that they could jump past being a distributor and build a business model that was about inspiring, exciting, creating cultural moments. The idea that you were able to engender Netflix and chill as a corporate, just, <laughs> just think about yeah, that. Yeah. Just that you're thinking completely differently than Blockbuster. Blockbuster was, I, I don't know if you, you may be too young to have gone to one. But oh, they, no. I, they were, they were, I just know they were like $2 more when you were going there as opposed to like the local convenience store. But they had the actual premium. Like if you wanted to get the movie, it, they would have it. Yeah. And it was a slightly nicer location, but there yeah. was really nothing of hard value that they that they added and in the end part of their issue was they saw themselves and would always be sitting in between the creatives and the audience netflix says no 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 no. we want to understand the audience extremely deeply and they did a bunch of deals to develop mathematics so that they could and then once they understood the audience which was only the domain of the big studios. Only Disney and Marvel can make huge and amazing movies, right? That's what, that was the mindset because mm -hmm. it's very risky, obviously, to make a, a movie, right? Yeah. You know, two hundred million dollars doesn't they come quick. Poured so much money into House of Cards. Totally. It's such a like that would have given me so much anxiety. But they knew right at the end if you create an, an MRC, obviously producing that show with Netflix, and that show was shopped around for a while before Netflix picked it up. But Netflix understood that to play in the content game, to really be effective as a competitor against cable networks, other studios, premium cable, obviously, the whole world, really, if you think yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if to be effective there, you needed to understand just the same way Bezos said, I need to understand one simple thing, the customer. What do they want? What is it going to excite them? And so Netflix, when I look at them, they understood distribution was the way into the home. But once you were in the house, what else to our point about what would you do if you're building your business model? You would figure out once you're in the house, what do they trust Netflix for? Same thing with Spotify now with podcasts, right? We were in the house. We were consuming everything in terms of music. Podcasts are just one step next door. And so that's a beautiful strategy. And Netflix was sitting there going, we already know what you like because we've seen it. We see the data coming in on what you're renting. We know where that's coming from. And we're actually watching you now, how you're consuming these things. We're going to build stuff that's better than that. We're going to build stuff that you're going to not only love, but they were going to become your lifestyle, like part of your world. And that's what they've accomplished. And that, when people talk about, I mean, Disney Plus, obviously, with Marvel and Lucas and all that, that's just impossible to talk about. But everybody else, when you think about Netflix and you really step back and you say, okay, Beyond, do they have a good show at this moment? Which the answer is yes, no matter what you want to watch. There's a lot of good stuff on there. The fact that they've now become part of your lifestyle is exceptional. Like mm -hmm. that, 
any economics guy or banking person or valuation person, when you see that, that's the what we call the intangible. It's like yeah. impossible to explain. Why do you love Apple? Like, help me understand that. Well, let me count the ways. Man. There's like a <laughs> yeah. hundred, right? Yeah. And the same thing with Netflix. I might not have something at this very moment that I want to watch, but tomorrow there'll be something. You know, Tuesday when new things come out, I'll find something there. But in my heart. Netflix is top of mind before I think of Hulu, before I think of yeah. Amazon Prime, before I think of um, my cable, because we don't have normal cable anymore. We haven't had it for a while. I think of, oh, let's go to Netflix and you just go on there and experience it. And that's powerful. Is that helpful in terms oh, of like oh, thinking oh, about oh, yeah. blockbusters? I, there's, there's, there's two different things I want to jump off from there. Um, one, just from what you said there at the end, when I think of getting rid of, um, if I were to strap down on finances and everything, I'd be like, all right, let's get rid of cable and all this other stuff. But like Netflix is like, yeah, we'll just keep Netflix, you know, just exactly. Like, we'll, just, we'll just keep it. Yeah, it's like yeah. we need something to be doing. Um, and that's right. The, just because it's part of my vernacular, like, yeah, just like you said, Netflix and chill. The big one that you said though was yeah. Spotify and podcasts. And sure. I think personally, just from being in the space, I love Spotify for podcasts. I had one, um, person that I did a podcast with that he had a huge Brazilian audience and he when I released the podcast everybody was asking him like oh where's it on Spotify and I normally I'm like here's the Apple link and they're like no where's it on Spotify so that one just took off on Spotify right and the thing I love about Spotify is there's many things but their analytics are so much more in depth. I can get so much more information from their back end than Apple Podcasts. Mm -hmm. The other thing too is uh, just because, like you said, people are there to watch. Or watch people are there to um, listen to music, and then it's already. It's just like it just makes sense. It's a convenient like I don't know fork in the road to like oh let me go listen yeah. to my podcast at the same time. Which just to, to, to say one comment. That already existed as a behavior. Like this is like an important point in that podcasts are essentially syndicated radio, like yeah. back in the day. And people were already used to going from a pop station to NPR. Yeah. It's like you're not blowing people's minds in like a bad way. They're like, oh, cool. I already understand this experience. They're just now on Spotify. This is amazing. And so you, you it made complete and utter sense because we, we yeah. one of our clients, we all we were really trying to push them to to think that way, not to think about podcast is just a way to put advertising against sound, but instead to think about it in terms of well, what is your audience? What would they be doing that would be similar to this that would increase actual listenership and, and, and time spent listening to podcasts? Yeah. So it's really cool. So Joe Rogan obviously has a yeah. huge podcast, right? Huge. And I know there was one episode or two that I was listening to, and he was talking about how the Spotify guys would come to him and be like, hey, we're starting a Spotify podcast. Like, you join the platform. And he's like, what are you going to do for me? I'm just like, I'm going to be bringing you so much on this platform. So yeah. to this day, uh, I don't think he's on Spotify. And I th think that's like, hey, I've been on Apple. And then obviously he's on YouTube, does really well in those spaces. Yeah. But I think it's more the the Facebook model of things where Spotify is just soaking up everybody, all of the other podcasts. So eventually everybody's just going to have to be on that platform, regardless of yeah. if you want to be there or not. And the last thing I want to say on it, too, is that the fact that Spotify already has in place ways to monetize passively to its creators. So I don't know how that will look for uh, podcasters and if podcasters will get paid for if you have so many downloads and then if somebody has a premium account, do they pay their podcasters? But in the future, since they already have that model there, it'd be awesome if it's like that's a thing. And if that happens or if it's already happening... I could see just Spotify overtaking Apple in the podcast realm, but I, I, the, I think Apple's just so huge right now because they were first in the space. But Spotify is just so disruptive in podcasts right now. I agree. Yeah, it's I am, and you probably have a view on this. I don't know where I sit right now. I feel like the podcast market is much like, frankly, the video market uh, for TV shows. There are so many. Yeah. And mm -hmm. there's some, uh, one of my clients has uh, one of their shows 
is connected to the number one outdoor podcast. Like, and nobody listens to it. It's mm-hmm. like, it's so small because there aren't many people in outdoor, but then you look at Joe Rogan and he has millions of people tuning into him. Mm-hmm. And so we look at that market and, and we're still like, we're still a little bit confused because as much as people are listening to podcasts, there's so many more hours than any humans could actually listen to it right now. So yeah. is it going to narrow itself down into like TV, frankly, where you have 10 podcasts that matter to the world and the rest of them are just like yeah. micro indie bands? Because if it devolves into that, which I hope it doesn't devolve into like, you know, the, you know, the, a terrible version of 10 terrible podcast shows. It's just because it's just when things become mass market, they tend to devolve a little mm-hmm. rather, rather than become more powerful and beautiful. And so if it devolves into that, it'll, it'll unfortunately just become those podcasts would probably be the ones that receive the most monetization. They would drive the most subscription value. Yeah. And so it becomes almost like cable network land now, where if you own ESPN, you drive a ton of audience and a ton of value because the market is narrowed down from a thousand different people talk. Because if you go and go to sports podcasts, there are tens of thousands of them. If you yeah. go to commentary on a cable platform for news, there's six channels, right? Yeah. The big ESPN, Fox Sports, blah, blah, blah. You know, like the main ones. There's obviously other ones that are lower ones. But if the market devolves into that, then you know what's going to happen. Those 10 podcasts are going to control the market, have the most value and, and have the most heft. And there'll be a rotation, just like in normal TV. Ones will fall out of favor, a new one will emerge. And that's usually driven by consumption and behavioral patterns in humans. Like we looked at cable networks for a client over 30 years. And what you found is we went from, you know, or really 60 years, we went from zero cable networks to now 900 cable networks, but humans only consistently watch three, no matter what port period of wow, time you're super in. super powerful what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> and so when you step back on podcasts, it's the same thing that happened in the app store for, for when we spent a lot of time with mobile gaming apps. Like there were a million studios that popped up in the, you know, the wave of mobile gaming. And then mm-hmm. every day there was, you know, I think, I can't remember what the peak number was, but it was thousands of new mobile games every day being published globally. The reality is no one has a thousand mobile games on their iPad or their phone or anything. Yeah. And it's a rotation in a handful of games if you look now and you went back and mapped casino games and then obviously like a candy crush yeah. kind of game and then something like a Fortnite or now the new call of duty mobile or something mm-hmm. like that it's always sort of similar because as much options as you give people we just don't actually like that many options and over time markets evolve so that piece of it is you have to step back on podcasts and say well where do i think the customer is moving are they going to be consuming a hundred to be a theme yeah it is and the end user (laughs) and the end user because it's like all right well where do i think they're gonna go do i think that people's daily habit is gonna turn into five podcasts a week because then you can build up a market you know based on that or if you say well no podcasts are kind of going to be like you know youtube reaction videos and there's going to be a small market for them people are going to dig them for a period and they might have like a boom in a certain segment for a second but then the the interest will die down because something new will happen and that's where we're going you know Mm -hmm. what i mean and there's a lot of stuff not to be like weird about it but there's a lot of stuff that somebody at like one of the big podcast businesses probably looked at was if you look at syndicated radio the syndicated radio do you know what that is versus normal radio uh uh, whole networks, correct? No, just think about it this way. Like um, back in the day when radio was coming up, you had a guy in there on a microphone like we are now talking all day and they would rotate different DJs in. Yep. And certain DJs like a Howard Cern got so big that they could actually syndicate. syndicate. And he would shop that that show and then it would appear on all different markets. The whole everything. nation. Yeah. And so we saw this evolution where you went from small market guy who's successful to national guy that's successful or, or woman that's successful. And then radio said, we're not going to we're not going to have DJs anymore. We're just going to use syndicated hosts. So Howard Stern became the, you know, the 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. guy, even though he was doing it in New York and California, right? Because mm-hmm. you could get him and he was consistent. Everyone loved Howard Stern. And then poof, you had a successful show versus relying on some local person who may or may not be funny enough in yeah. the L.A. market. So you could look about think about podcasts the same way. They basically went through what was radio, which is people just talking and giving news or talking about current events or NPR telling stories. And they chopped it up and said, okay, this is a political block. This is a drive time block, like a Howard Stern, you know, Mm -hmm. jokes and like fun, you know, fun interviews. 
This is uh, a sports block, you know, CBS Sports. If you hear on the weekends on the radio, that's syndicated radio. It's the same thing as a lot of the podcasts now. It's just structured and distributed differently. And it doesn't have, with radio, it's obviously controlled because the FCC. In this instance, it's not. It's You can get it anywhere. But then I step back and go, well, that's great that there's so much volume out there, but what are people really consuming and listening to every day? If it's just like the movie business, like we pretend like there's a million successful movie producers, but you know, 80% of the movie ticket sales are from a very small set of studios, really four of them now. And so the same thing, the podcast market could evolve that way too, where you have a handful of producers controlling the marketplace and it starts sort of, sort of looks like that. Number one for each segment. Number one in sports. Number one in outdoor. Number one in fashion lifestyle. One at number one in Joe Rogan, whatever you want to call <laughs> what he does. Joe Rogan just gets his own genre. Exactly. <laughs> and and you even see some of that evolution now. And that's why we're kind of we're we're not sure where it's going to go because usually you'll see in terms of top podcast some of the syndicated radio guys popping up like NPR. They're usually top as well. People will go on and listen to some of their stuff and um, on podcasts. So it's like. It's sort of the same people. Are these the people that used to drive in their car and listen to NPR or, you know, CBS Sports or whatever, and they're just listening to it on a podcast now? Or is this a, a new a explosion? Carte. Yeah, a la carte. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. Podcasts I worry about, and this is the last thing on podcasts. I worry about podcasts only because it's struggled a little to, to generate really hard growth and monetization. Like the advertising piece of it is tougher because you're doing sponsorships up front. And mm -hmm. once, once you're, once the sponsorship is recorded, like I hear like Joe Rogan, when I listen to him or anyone's podcast that has sponsorships, you're sometimes hearing the same sponsor from like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. It's harder to like suss in new sponsors, like with TV shows, you can rerun them mm -hmm. and then put a different advertisement in, you know, yeah. each break. It's harder with podcasts, it seems like. Well, with so the syndication service that I use is Libsyn. And in Libsyn, uh, once you hit a certain mark, you can actually go in and exchange out your, your, your ads. ads on your entire library, which that's, I know on the back end, when you look at it, in the interface, it's like email so and so at Lipson to yeah. do this. It's like it's yeah. some, some like random some some guy at Lipson that's like, okay, you want to uh, overhaul your whole catalog? Here's my job. Like it's just like that's, that's where amazing. it's at right now. Okay, <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. But I know that there are systems in place in order to if you have set up your podcast in a way that here's the before the podcast starts and here's the break. We can take those out of the MP3s and insert your new uh, new ads. Uh, your new ads, so it, it's refreshed. And that way, the uh, the end user or I guess the content creator can get more against the ads that they're trying to sell. That's great. Um, yeah. But I mean, that again, that's just like a little small piece of it. Uh, let's let's start to wrap it up with what you do. What you do? Why do you do it? Why do we do it? It was a very simple evolution. We started working with clients that had really, really bold aspirations. And we realized that what we could offer just as bankers and consultants was limited. Like it only offered, if it'd be kind of like, let's build a house, but we only invited a plumber and a carpenter. Like you're missing so many pieces. And many of our clients continued to struggle because the markets were going really fast. Their competition was getting more fierce. So we just envisioned a, a, a new and extremely unique solution, which was let's look at this first starting by defining the problem, figuring out what team you really needed to attack it, and then deliver that team, even if it meant going beyond bankers and consultants into strategists, into data scientists, into content people. Mm -hmm. And then we, we built these interdisciplinary teams from scratch and we really saw massive results. And we we're like, hold on a second. like if if everything that we've been trained to do is wrong in that we just offer one small little piece of the puzzle and that can control the outcome very well, what if we worked much more completely with our clients to deliver something comprehensive? And then four years ago, that's where we started. And I've been following along because it's been fascinating to see the transition, like talking with me versus talking to a normal like business person. I've been fundamentally altered by seeing this process over and over and over. And whereas to your questions early on, where before I would start with a piece of technology or I'd start with a platform or an understanding about, you know, 
what how the business is operating today we now start with you know what is the fundamental thing you're trying to achieve and who is the audience that you think is interested in that or consumers and then how do we build something exceptional below that that's very different as a business model so you can be more successful than you ever would have been if you just kind of did it like everybody else so that's why mm -hmm. yeah, yeah you're it seems like you're very in tuned to making things work for even if it's the most ob ob obscure of ideas or you may be able to take that process and be like oh so you say it may be this one thing but really what it's at its heart is this other thing i'm talking in exactly. complete generalities but i'm sure you've had conversations yeah. like that well it just goes <laughs> it goes back to steve jobs right in in his thinking about with apple that we can we can define problems based on what we know or we can start defining play problems on what we hope to achieve you know that aspirational rule breaking kind of attitude and idea and that always means you're going to move into a place where everything isn't certain anymore yeah you know and where you're coming up with something brand new and it always sounds nutty right it always sounds just crazy in the beginning like if i were to if you didn't know a social platform and i described even something as like normal today is facebook you'd be like whoa what the fuck is that like, yeah why exactly. why same thing with youtube it, all of these things are magical when we first experience them but the reality is like with youtube when it when you first experienced it and thought it was magic whoever created that was thinking five years a, a, away from now mm -hmm. you know and saying oh this is going to be amazing this is going to be the most important thing where all this interaction is going to happen and so our job is to sit down with people that on their face may seem crazy, right? Or have aspirations that are crazy and on either direction. When you're a big company and you're failing and nothing's working, hoping that something's gonna work is crazy. Because you know what I mean? Because <laughs> yeah. it's like, all right, we've you know, this has been terrible. And it's the same way that if someone comes to us and goes, Hey, we wanna do X, Y, and Z and it's never been done before, that sounds crazy too. So it, it's just different forms of crazy, you know, yeah. but, but both, both inherently the same, you know, in terms of their ultimate end goals, something better, something exceptional, something beautiful coming out of it, you know. Last question I ask, and I'm very interested to see what your answer is for this, but I like to ask people what's their best investment in the last year that they've made? Yeah. Oh, man, this is going to sound weird. I, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to do a non-financial one. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what I mean. Like it yeah. could be personal uh, yeah. business, whatever it may be. Yeah. I, I will. It's, it's literally changed my life, which is I, I grew up just to give context. I grew up in a military household with not a lot of money. So I led a life where I just thought if you work really hard and keep your head down and push, things will work out for you. Right. Like mm -hmm. that attitude. I realized that's really a terrible way to look at life. And uh, the beginning of the year, I started meditating. I started doing more physical activity and, and, and said, in, instead of just activity and push and action, I started to try to find like calm and patience and, and much more contemplative approach towards life. And it has changed my life. The investment in the time to meditate, even with like a little goofy app for 10 times a day, just radically altered my life of just taking a beat, you know, rather than constantly grinding. And I found that it, it is, it's changed my relationship with my wife. Um, it changed my relationship with clients and it's given me a newfound sense of calm that do you ever watch this, this old movie apocalypse now, yeah. you know, with William Duvall, it's like in the middle of a battlefield on a, on a, on a beach where bombs are exploding on around him. And, and the narrator is talking about how like, even though the bombs are exploding, he's just he's walking so casually and but he's deeply engaged and he understands the situation and he's moving towards, you know, confronting it. But he's not erratic. He's not overwhelmed. He's not stressed. And I wanted to find that headspace and like be there. Mm -hmm. And and I've slowly been building myself up towards that. And that's been the thing that's I would say fundamentally altered so many facets of my life. You know, it's amazing. Well. And this is me assuming you probably are dealing with so much money uh, in terms of like your clients and everything. So that has to be super stressful. And that would be like a metaphor to the bombs going off and everything like that. So in order for you to be in charge or have the uh, execution or the, the knowledge to be like, we should do this with said things probably comes with a lot of stress. And in order to achieve a higher level of just like calmness. 
That's right. Sounds like, and it just the reality is, is we don't, and this isn't just my idea. This is science's idea. It's that we don't make the best decisions when we're under stress, and oftentimes, and this is the biggest thing, we don't see obvious alternatives that could be way better for us or the situation. Or we don't see certain pieces because of the stress and the feeling of must come to a conclusion, must move to the next step. I've just learned that now not channeling like Warren Buffett or like some Zen Buddhist, but just being honest about it. It's sometimes the answer is not to look for the answer. It's to try to reframe the question. And that means pulling back and contemplating and thinking about the situation versus just saying as is the case in most business people, because this is what you're trained. If you're a leader, right? Mm -hmm. If you're that guy or girl, you're supposed to be able to make quick decisions and do all these things. The reality is sometimes the situation is so complex and difficult that there's no perfect right answer. And that screws with people's brains. It just (laughs) makes you melt down because you feel no uncertainty. I think we as a group, because of where we came from and, and a lot of the people surrounding us is, we're now learning more and more that there's real power in that, like that calm and that stillness and that ability to like look at a business decision or a business problem with a very Zen beginner's mind. And this is the weirdest part of it all that we found is oftentimes the answers to those problems don't lie in business answers. There's sometimes the person framing it is just hyped out and freaked out or whatever, and they're not looking at it clearly. Or sometimes you're siloed and you're thinking, you're trying to like think about it based on what you know versus saying, hey, instead of looking at it like a media guy or girl, let's look at it as a, a retail brand person. How would they attack this question? Or you know, a material scientist, how would they attack this question? Because process and intelligence doesn't have to come just from media for us or technology. It can come from anywhere. It could be a PhD researcher studying education who's, tr- who's trying to, who's figured out something new about the way we learn and, and understand things. We can take that knowledge into our thinking about business models and marketing and product and, yeah. and all of that. And so that's what, that's what I would say is, is really important for people to understand, particularly people building businesses that are massively stressed, freaked out every day and worried about what's happening next. If you if you stop and spend 15 to 20 minutes, half an hour a day, if you can pull it off, just contemplating about these things that cause you anxiety and, and really saying, are those the ones I should be focused on? You'll see massive change in your behavior and you'll see massive change in your execution because um, we just don't spend enough time on mental toughness with people. We just you're like, hey, you have a college degree, you're smart, go build a business. It's insane. It's so hard. <laughs> you know, it's like a yeah. million things every day. And you can do it if you take it step by step and are realistic with yourself and really understand what you're going through. But if you're freaked out and just running in a million directions, you're going to lose your mind and you're going to, you're probably going to fail worse because it's okay to fail. That's the reality in life. Like the third failure, they say, is what gets you to the billion dollar idea. So mm-hmm. it's okay to fail. Um, but doing it in a way that keeps your sanity and in, intact in, in and makes you be able to look back later and go, oh, that was, wasn't a terrible experience. It was actually really nurturing. And I developed a lot, even though the business didn't survive or turn into a billion dollar unicorn, um, that mental development that you get alongside it is going to make you powerful, like an extremely powerful. Cause you just, I know it sounds crazy. Some of your listeners might, might hear this, but I know a lot of CEOs of big publicly traded companies that are the most erratic and broken people. And they've gotten there and they hang on as best they can, but their lives are terrible. They have, you know, substance issues or family issues or whatever it is because they can't deal with the basics in life. If you start at the beginning and you take control of your, your mindset and your mentality, you'll be able to go so much further. And then once you get big, you'll be prepared for it versus... It'd be like throwing me, no one can see me, but if you saw me throwing me into like a professional basketball game, (laughs) I've never played sports, I don't know anything. (laughs) It's the same way as for the mental side of business where oftentimes we have a, a, a degree or an education and we get thrown into a business context, but we don't have the mental preparedness to handle it. And people forget that, like, you, oh, you have an MBA. I watch people around me at, at Wall Street, like, melt down and quit because they had an MBA. They supposedly could do the job, 
but the stress of working constantly all the time, being yelled at, that the culture in Wall Street is just terrible. Um, and they would melt down and ultimately quit, or some kids would you know, kids commit suicide or whatever. Um, and that's, that's a, a lack of mental toughness. Not that you should have to deal with any of that ever, but same thing with the military, right? That's why a big part of what they put you through is in the Navy SEALs isn't just being able to carry a boat or shoot a gun. It's can you sit in the sand in the freezing cold for 24 hours and not break, you know, mm -hmm. that's totally different thing. And you can train yourself that way as well through meditation and build that mental toughness. And so none of those problems you're confronting as you scale, as you think about capital, as you think about building something bigger will frighten you. Instead, they'll embolden you and, and make you make you a massive success. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. I think a, a strong ratio of the, my most recent guests, as I've asked that question, it hasn't been uh, business type of answers. It's been exactly what you're talking oh, about. Oh, really? It's okay. Like, it's been, I, let me tell you, I started getting fit. Or let me tell you, I said that I was going to shut off my computer at 7 p.m. And I'm going, like, and now I'm spending time with my husband. And obviously there's outliers or there's, there, like, there's an 80 20 rule there. But for the most part, I'm, they're they're cutting off from whatever their work component may be and spending time on themselves, whether that be through fitness, meditation, or some other means. I love it. Yeah, I love it. it. But it, there's got to be for those listening. There's got to be something to that, and myself included. Uh, I if you were to ask me that question, I recently did a challenge which was something similar, where you do like drink drink a whole bunch of water each day, get fit, and then also um, like read ten pages of a book and uh, like all these awesome. simple things, but. Uh, in doing that, I like, and part of it was like spending time. You had to spend 45 minutes outside doing an exercise each day. And I think that was the best part of it because being a video editor, just being inside, like it can get taxing. Oh, I'm sure. But when you spend 45 minutes outside, I, if I'm actually, once I got done with the challenge and I'm like really into edits now, I go outside and I like just, literally a breath of fresh air is like, whoa, vitamin D from the sun. This is awesome. Like it's really rejuvenating, For but sure. I don't want to hold up people too much longer. If people want to contact you or if they want to get involved or uh, how would they go about looking where you're at? Yeah, they can go look at our website. Obviously there's a ton of information there or anyone can contact me through LinkedIn or any of the social platforms if they want to talk about stuff. I'm mm -hmm. happy to connect with anybody and give advice. Yeah, and it's choir spelled Q-U-I-R-E, correct? That's right. Uh, and it's thechoir.com. Exactly, yep. Awesome. That's right. Well, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. All right. And until next episode, if you guys wanted to share this out, I would love you forever. Hope you're out there living a life of abundance, and I'll see you guys on the next podcast.